The first details of Megadeth's inaugural Mega Cruise have officially been announced, confirming that Norwegian Jewel will set sail on October 13, 2019, from Los Angeles, California and hit ports of San Diego, California and Ensenada, Mexico before returning on October 18, 2019. The initial list of performers has also been announced, they are Megadeth, Anthrax, Testament, Corrosion of Conformity, Devil Driver, Metal Church, Doro, John 5, Armored Saint, Bisto Blanco, and Metalachi. The cheapest tickets for the cruise cost $1,085 per person with taxes included, the priciest ones are $5,184 per person with included taxes, providing accommodation in the Haven Owner Suite with Gold VIP. The official announcement reads, While there are dozens of daily performances by our featured artists, that's just the beginning of the fan experience. Quite simply, the Norwegian Jewel will become the home of artists and fans, interacting in many different ways throughout the five-night voyage. This interactive experience affords you a variety of events and activities that will put you front and center with metal icons that have been an integral part of your life. From artist photo experiences to intimate morning coffee jams, music clinics to fan slash artists sporting competitions and more, there's always a way to get up close and personal with your favorite artists. You might happen to bump into one of your faves at one of the Jewel's many watering holes, or possibly share a moment at the charity auction. This is truly a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Mega Cruise is the ultimate heavy metal experience, where music and cruising combine for the vacation of a lifetime. Dave Mustaine was recently asked by Metal Hammer to share his thoughts on the latest Metallica album Hardwired to Self-Destruct. The frontman noted, I've always been able to appreciate the talent in Metallica. Every band has its strengths and its weaknesses. Personally, from everything I've heard so far, I think the new album is a good one. I hear that a lot of people have been making comments about Kirk Hammett and Rob Trujillo not writing anything on it. But sometimes that's just unavoidable. I guess I would have loved more writing from both those guys, because I loved infectious grooves and suicidal tendencies and I always loved the lines Kirk wrote with Exodus, but that's the way the cookie crumbles when you're in the studio. The best songs make the cut. Everyone wants to pick the best things. When it comes down to critiquing production stuff, it's kind of a personal thing. One man's trash is another man's treasure. For example, I know a lot of people really dig Rick Rubin and the way that he produces stuff. While I respect Rick tremendously, I do think that what he does with bands like The Cult really works and then when he does stuff with metal bands it doesn't necessarily translate in the same way. Hardwired is definitely a different sounding record than, for example, Saint Anger, and it sounds pretty good to me. I know it took him 8 years to make this record so I'm glad for them that people are digging it. It's a small community, you know? What did you think about Metallica's Hardwired to Self-Destruct? Tell us in the comments below. There has always been controversy over who is, or was the best Megadeth guitarist, but with Mustaine he is pretty clued up on it, as he ranked them all in a tweet not so long ago. As you can see, the rundown doesn't feature Megadeth's original second guitarist Greg Handovit, who was in the band only in 1983, nor Slayer's Kerry King, who spent a brief period in the death fold during 1984, but does include Mike Albert, who performed as a touring member and temporary replacement for Chris Poland in 1985. As Kiko is the number one in this list he did have some great things to say about him in an interview explaining to Rev 96.7. I've been really fortunate to play with many, many great guitar players, but Kiko, every day, it's just a new experience seeing how deep his knowledge of playing is. Some other guitar players I've played with were really great at what they did, but their depth was only in one genre. For example, Chris Poland is a remarkable jazz player, and I had to kind of teach him metal because he didn't know anything about it. And Marty was very much into metal but also had a lot of Middle Eastern playing styles. Now Kiko has metal, he's got bossa nova, he's got classical, flamenco, so many other different styles, the possibilities are endless. And I think that's evident on this new record, Dystopia. The guitar playing went up considerably from the last record. Who is your favorite Megadeth guitarist? And would you agree with Dave Mustaine's opinion? Tell us your thoughts in the comments below. Dave Mustaine says that his initial vision for Megadeth was to destroy Metallica. Asked by a fan earlier this year on Twitter what his measure of success was when starting Megadeth and what his vision for the band was. Dave responded, my measure of success was if I ate that day or not, and my vision was destroy Metallica and stop living in a van. Good thing I got over my animosity for leaving the band. 
I'm glad we reconciled, where's the big four shows? Mustaine was a member of Metallica for less than two years, from 1981 to 1983, before being dismissed and replaced by Kirk Hammett. He went on to form Megadeth and achieve worldwide success on his own. Mustaine feuded with the members of Metallica for more than two decades before finally patching things up over the last few years. He has jammed with his ex-bandmates on several occasions during Big Four shows and at Metallica's 30th anniversary concerts in 2011. He also recently expressed the struggles he had with escaping Metallica's shadow, saying, it wasn't easy escaping from Metallica's shadow. It takes effort and energy to get a band off the ground, never mind when you have an enormous band stepping on top of your head every time you get above water. Giving the new metal genre quite a bashing, Megadeth frontman Dave Mustaine noted he'd rather have his eyelids pulled out than listen to the popular late 90s style, new metal. Telling Faster Louder how happy he is for the new wave of modern musicians, calling them a new breed of players. With all these new vocal styles, Dave focused on the past, adding, they had this wave of metal that came through in the 90s, and it was called new metal, I don't know if you remember it, but it was so bad. I would have rather had my eyelids pulled out. Asked if it's Limp Biscuit and Linkin Park he's talking about, Mustaine explained, no no. I can't even remember their names. Linkin Park, those guys are good at what they do. I have no problems with those guys. But I wouldn't call them new metal. Pinpointing the groups he has issues with, he continued, I'm talking about the bands that wouldn't do guitar solos. Guys who get out there and they do rhythms and stuff but they'd never do a guitar solo. It's like, come on, play a solo. But apparently solos aren't cool. It's just funny, because I come from the school of ACDC and Led Zeppelin, and man, the riff had to be kick-ass, the lyrics had to make sense, and when it was time for the solo, the solo had to rip your face off," Dave said. And hey I may not be part of the family anymore, right at the forefront, but I'm the crazy uncle. Dave Mustaine also let loose on new metal bands during an interview with Cry of the Wolf, saying, during that whole period a couple of years ago, when no one was doing guitar solos, we had a couple of bands go out with us, and I despised them. And the reason they went out with us was because the label said you need to do this. That was the worst part of my career during that whole new metal thing. You know there were no solos, because the guitar players weren't good enough to do solos. In an interview with the self-proclaimed libertarian Alex Jones on Infowars.com, Megadeth's Dave Mustaine opened up about his thoughts on playing with satanic bands. Dave Mustaine, a born Christian, talked about setting the ground rules on who he would or would not share the stage with. According to him he said, if I do play, there's certain things I kind of want to veer away from. I don't want to play with any satanic bands. He narrowed it down a bit further saying, I'll play with bands that have darkness in them, because we all have a little darkness in us. Or we wouldn't be human. But guys that are confessed Satanists, I don't really have time for that. I can control my emotions, because I know it's not the sinners, it's the sin. He also talked about his refusal to share the stage with the openly satanic Swedish metal act dissection at an Israeli festival back in 2005, saying, The truth of the matter is, is that when I first had gotten you know, my life back in order back in 2002. I had made some changes. You know, I, I uh, had a, a severe injury to my arm, and when my career had stopped, it made me really take a hard, sideways look at everything. And I figured, you know what, just for now, because I don't really know a lot about what I'm doing, I want to make sure that I don't play with any bands that have junkies in them because I, I can't be around you know, guys that are doing heroin because of the temptation. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, I, I'm trying to have something in my life that is a power greater than myself so that I'll get myself back in, in, in shape. And um, I don't want to be hanging around with guys that are going to, you know, be uh, dangerous for me spiritually because I had just decided that, you know, I was going to start following um, a spiritual path. I figured, you know what, I, I don't want to go back, because I was into witchcraft and black magic and everything like that, so I know about that stuff, and I figured, you know what, I'm just going to try and avoid that stuff. Never said that I hated anybody, just, just didn't want to play with them, and, and I was so curious to see the uh, poster for the concert, because it was written in, in you know, the Hebrew font, 
or script, whatever you call it. And then I saw the band Dissection, and I, and I thought, well, that's a cool name. And I looked it up, and I went, uh-oh. So uh, I told the promoter, I said, look, we can't play. We're, we're, we're not going to play that festival. I never said kick them off. Well, yeah, of that course, of course. Yeah, yeah. That was the promoter's mistake. The promoter kicked them off. And it's hard enough as it is in music to get concerts, so I would never kick a band off one of my shows. Yeah, yeah. Um, for I would sure. rather me not do it. And, and when I said, look, we don't, we don't want to do it, they, they unfortunately harmed that band. Regardless whether the guy was a convicted murderer, he was a satanic uh, uh, person, you know, we all have a little bit of darkness in us. Now, I've never killed anybody, you know, killed a couple of guitars, but, <laughs> you know, I've never <laughs> killed anybody. And, and, you know, the sad thing is at the end of the day, the poor guy had committed suicide. So, you know, he was a tortured soul. And, and I yeah. know that for me, the reason that I turned to black magic and witchcraft and stuff like that was I had had uh, spiritual abuse and, and um, so many things had been done wrong in my life and there was so much hypocrisy with the people that had said that they were Christians and or, you know, whatever, Catholic, whatever, the people in my life. And they would say one thing and they would do something else. So I really regretted um, having spent any time in a church and I really resented people who said that they believed in God because you would see them do one thing and then the next day they would, you know, they would do something else. And, and it's just very confusing as a kid. And I think that's why a lot of us end up, you know, being spiritually misled probably part of the reason why that poor chap did that too but you know um we we were supposed to play a show with them in, in france and they didn't get kicked off that show you know a lot of stuff went around about another band that that had a name that you know was kind of offensive to me but you know that, that's that's a personal thing it has nothing to do with the band their their quality of music. yeah but, but you can expect you can expect that the, the produ the producer of a show to 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 cancel megadeth when he it's standing like right opposed to to dissection or rotting christ because like those are little bands and megadeth is You know, that's that's a Megadeth. huge band. That, that that's Megadeth. You know, so I know, but but guys, what you gotta understand is my heart for those guys has nothing to do. You know, my decision not to play with them doesn't have anything to do with their value and worth as people because I'm sure they're they're probably really great people. Sometimes we name our band stuff to get a reaction out of people, and it's not really who or what we are. And you know, there there are bummers and there, there are consequences. Naming Megadeth, Megadeth. I can't even tell you. How offensive it was! Uh, there's a huge radio station in Los Angeles called KLOS, and we had done a song. And after the song was over, they go, "And that was a cover of an old Alice Cooper song." Coming up next, they didn't even say our name. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't say Megadeth on the radio. So, yes. has not, you know, it has nothing to do with with the, the person's worth or anything like that because okay. I believe we're all valuable and and. You know, it's just, just a personal preference that I had at the time. I, I've learned a lot more now. So, you know, if the opportunity came up to play with bands that, that were you know, contrary to what my you know, personal, political, spiritual, or, or, or any kind of moral values that I have, you know, that's something between me and my relationship with God. And, and you know, I don't push that on anybody anymore. At the beginning... You know, I, I didn't know, and I wanted to play it safe. And I think that anybody who would judge me and say, oh, well, you know what, Dave made a huge mistake. He just joined a new club, but he didn't know all the rules, so instead of breaking the rules, he said, fuck you to everybody. That's not me, man. I like to do things right. So I played it safe, I learned a lot about it, and, I, you know, I've opened my mind up to it. Dave Mustaine shared his thoughts on Meshuggah. After getting to hear the band a bit more often during ongoing joint tour with Megadeth, telling Cat Rock, They're really exciting. It's not even because the drumming is so complicated, really it's just four-fourths timing the majority of the time. But the way the songs are, and how unique they are, they take on a characteristic of their own. You could so easily get lost trying to follow. What do they call that? Algebra metal or something like that? All these timings and stuff like that. You know, the stuff I listened to growing up, the new wave of British heavy metal, it was straightforward riffing like ACDC and then going into Priest and Maiden, and then getting into heavier stuff, Motorhead, Diamond Head, Merciful Fate, everything was straightforward. So having a tour with Megadeth, Meshuga, Tesseract, and Lil Lake where we have these young exciting bands, it's always really entertaining, because I get to see stuff I never would have been compelled to pick up in a record store. It opens my mind a lot. I remember the first time I took out this really great band called The Dillinger Escape Plan. I couldn't understand it, but I just knew they were really exciting. 
It's the stuff you don't understand you most often miss out on. I wanted to understand, so we took them out on Giganter. It was a great experience, I thought they were terrific. And that was my introduction to that type of crazy, cerebral metal. He also talked about drummer Dirk Verburen, saying, as good as Adler was, Dirk's feet are more advanced. I didn't think that was possible, because Chris is such a great drummer. There's a reason why Chris recommended Dirk, and I love him for that. I think that he's a really solid friend for making that recommendation, cause a lot of guys wouldn't do that. He's a true friend, and I was stoked having him in the studio. Dirk is one of the most pleasant, easy to get along with guys I've ever met in my life. I'll walk up to him, and he'll smile, and lean forward, and pat me on the back. He goes, how's it going, buddy? I could say, oh man, anything. Oh, okay buddy. He smiles and pats me, cause he's just a happy guy.